Professor Opsfeld, I, I would suggest Bloomberg Economics got it right, which is it's a very constructive economic outlook, but then. How far out is the but then when the global economy ebbs? Well, Tom, as always, our forecast consists of a baseline, but then we worry about the risks. So, uh, you know, we do see global growth moderating a bit over the next, uh, uh, after the next couple of years. But we do see a number of risks out there, and they range from uh, risks to financial stability to the, uh, you know, the big risk people are talking about here this week, which is risks around international trade. Well, international trade will clearly be uh, front and center. You've got an almost 300-page economic outlook filled with lots of smart analysis of the ideas and the concepts ahead. In paragraph three, you get right to it, which is high debt levels worldwide, I would suggest led by the United States and the new trillion-dollar deficits. How does Maurice Obsfeld translate the new trillion-dollar deficits of the U.S.? Well, the, the, the U.S., uh, according to what we've been recommending for a while, um, faces fiscal challenges, uh, uh, in particular from entitlement programs, and so needs to put its debt and its government obligations generally on a more sustainable path. Um, from that standpoint, um, the, uh, the uh, increase in the deficit is not going in the right, in the right direction. It's also coming at a time when the U.S. is at full employment. Uh, so it's leaving, and this is a, really a problem for, for many countries with high sovereign debt levels, not much ammunition in the case uh, of a new recession down the road. Well, that would be a fear of the new recession down the road. I know Ambrose Evans Pritchard and the Telegraph folks writing up overnight about a slowdown in Germany. Tell us about the European economy. Everything was wonderful even weeks ago, and now there's selected data of a rolling over in EU growth. Do you observe that at the IMF? Uh, last year was uh, really a banner year for them with, uh, you know, sequential positive surprises. Uh, the first quarter of this year, a little bit of the wind seems to have gone out of their sails. We see um, uh, some negative news on exports and in confidence indicators. Uh, I think it's too early to tell if this is, if this is a trend or if uh, 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 it's just a, a soft patch for them. But uh, we'll be monitoring it closely. Dr. Obsfeld, I have a question about the U.S. You've upgraded this and next year's growth by just 0.2 percentage points. What have you included in that, given that we don't really know what kind of fiscal spending we'll see and, indeed, what trade pacts we'll be in or out of? Well, I mean, in the broader, in the broader perspective, uh, you know, if you compare what we're forecasting now uh, for the U.S. for 2018 compared to what we forecast in October before any of the recent tax legislation, We've upgraded uh, growth by 0.6 percentage points, which is really a substantial, uh, a substantial increase. Uh, and that's reflecting that there'll be more investment, that there'll be more government spending. Now, um, you know, in terms of the, the trade outlook, uh, we don't factor that in yet because many of the measures have been announced but not yet uh, undertaken. Now, of course, if all the threats out there are, uh, are implemented, and if things indeed get a lot worse, then we could see notable effects on not only U.S. growth, but global growth. What additional growth or what overall growth rate would it take for the IMF to be concerned that perhaps uh, inflation might become a problem in the U.S. and there would need to be a third extra interest rate increase this year? Well, we, we, we are uh, predicting more interest rate increases already than the, than the Fed is. Uh, and we would look not so much at growth, because growth can come from supply-side factors as well, but probably at labor markets. And there we see unemployment dropping below 3.5% uh, uh, eventually, which is, which is not a level we've seen in a, in a very long time for, for many decades. So, uh, you know, at that level, we would see uh, some wage acceleration and possibly price acceleration. Professor Obsfeld, I'm going to make the assumption that President Trump has not read cover to cover your classic text, Obsfeld Rogoff and International Economics. If you were to speak to the president today about his interpretation of free trade, 
or fair trade, what would you say to him to make America great again? Well, I think there are, there are legitimate uh, points that the U.S. raises about the, uh, the scope of the multilateral trading system. Uh, you know, it's been very valuable as a, uh, a uh, support uh, for growth in the post-war period. It's been essential, I would say, uh, uh, rather than valuable. But uh, there are aspects in which it uh, falls behind the times and in which it doesn't fully capture the range of trade problems that are there. For example, uh, the, uh, the definition of subsidies that the WTO deals with are very, very narrow, and there are legitimate concerns about whether uh, supportive state-owned enterprises in China uh, constitute a subsidy. It's an issue we've raised with the Chinese simply because they need to work on that to get higher growth uh, domestically. Um, the area of services is not well dealt with, and services is an emerging area of U.S. comparative advantage in trade. So, you know, my advice would be uh, let's work with the trade system. Let's try to improve it. Let's cooperate with our uh, uh, trade partners, because trade is not a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game if uh, it's allowed to, uh, to operate and to work in the way that economists say it does to uh, increase uh, the division of labor and to increase productivity. Would you suggest that the president and Dr. Navarro and the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, are having an effect on the Chinese? Their discourse, their tone of voice, is it making for a changed discourse from China? I think the Chinese would like to um, settle the current differences without trade conflict in a, in a uh, more collaborative way. I think the U.S. should be open to that. And, uh, uh, but again, it's important to, to think about the multilateral system. You know, these uh, bilateral uh, issues are important, but they will come up again and again and again unless countries reach an agreement on how to, how to handle these sorts of disputes. And I think that's where the multilateral system can be strengthened to everyone's advantage. Dr. Oxfeld, there was some great work done very recently. In fact, it's in the analytical chapters of the Fiscal Monitor about productivity, you know, when it comes to manufacturing versus services. Explain to us, if you would, why the U.S. shouldn't be afraid of becoming more service-oriented. In fact, almost all service-oriented, and why that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, yeah, we, we um, you know, we have a chapter on this in the uh, New World Economic Outlook, and... Uh, we show that, contrary to the conventional wisdom, uh, you know, productivity in, in services can be equally high as in manufacturing. Now, manufacturing is associated with um, uh, you know, good jobs for workers uh, at uh, middle or lower levels of, of education. And uh, in fact, it's been in the past a very important stepping stone to the, to the middle class. But we have to recognize that as productivity grows in manufacturing, and that's something that is uh, inevitable and that we all desire, uh, manufacturing needs to employ fewer and fewer workers. And uh, the additional incomes that are generated get spent on services. So at some level, services are the future. And uh, you know, we need to prepare our labor forces through investments in people, for example, better education, better preschool childcare to uh, take advantage of uh, a service economy because you know, we're already mostly services mm -hmm. and the trend is uh, just going to continue.